Hello, dear colleagues. My name is Daria Melnikova. I'm the second year student faculty of the World Culture, the Department of Foreign Languages, Linguistics. And as you can see on the slide, the topic of my speech is Netherlinguistics, first and second language acquisition. Netherlinguistics is a cutting edge, multidisciplinary field of study. It is developed by linguists, psychologists, physiologists, and even specialists in artificial intelligence and philosophers. And of course, we don't have enough time to cover all aspects of this fascinating field of study in the space of this presentation, but you'll have an opportunity to get acquainted with several important topics. So it will be like the introduction to Nella Linguistics, and it is exactly the name of the first point of today's presentation. Then I will briefly tell you about the most important for the language parts of the brain, and only after it, we will move directly to the language acquisition. So let us start. Netherlinguistics is a science that aims to discover what exactly occurs in the human brain when we speak, listen to the speech, perceive complex stimuli, and in general, engage in complex mental activity that is characteristic of our species. So in more simple words, it is the branch of, lingu of linguistics dealing with the relationship between language and the structure and functioning of the brain. Now let us move on to the parts and structures of the brain. Of course, uh, the brain is very complex, but today we should get acquainted with the most important parts, otherwise it would be very difficult to understand the rest of the information. These are the main parts of the brain that we are going to encounter during this presentation when we discuss uh, the way they affect language or more precisely how they give rise to language. The brain is divided into four lobes, and these lobes exist, exist in each hemisphere. The, they are the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the parental lobe. The frontal lobes are concerned with behavior planning, motivation, reasoning, and problem solving. The parental lobes process the information from tactile receptors, that is, from the skin, they assess temperature and pain and perform a lot of language-related functions. Occipital lobes are mainly concerned with the reception and processing of visual information in a very broad sense. Occipital regions not only recognize faces and help us navigate the space around us, but assess complex visual scenes in general. They also deal with language because the process of reading starts with us perceiving the text using these regions of the brain. And the temporal lobes. The temporal lobes process uh, mainly, the temporal lobe process mainly auditory information and the information it comes from the hippocampus, uh, the main part of the brain associated with memory. And in this slide, you can see basic most important areas that provide the basis for human speech. One of them is the Broca's area. This is the area that provides the basis for expressive speech. Right now, as I speak, the Broca's area in my brain is the most active. The second is the Wernicke's area. Located in the more posterior areas of the brain with respect to the frontal lobes, the Wernicke's area is in charge of speech perception. For example, a patient with a lesion in the Broca's area, in the worst case, is mute, isn't able to speak at all. While a patient with a serious lesion in the Wernicke's area can speak, but loses, but loses the ability to comprehend speech, such patient hears the sound but doesn't understand their meaning. Now, when we have done the parts of human brain, we can move directly to the language acquisition. And I'd like to start with the definition. Language acquisition is a process by which humans acquire the capacity to perceive and comprehend language. In other words, 
with uh, gain the ability to be aware of language and to understand it, as well as to produce and use words and sentences to communicate. Our first language acquisition starts in early childhood. That is why all the examples and all the researchers in this area of first language acquisition are done with the children. Now, I'd like to mention that I'm not going to analyze the processes in the brain of the bilingual children. It is very interesting, but also very huge topic that deserves a separate presentation. So let's start, monolingual children. On the slide, you may see the main characteristics of the first language acquisition. You may see them, but I will uh, read them for you. Uh, first language is learned by the children in a natural way, through listening, imitating, analyzing, and so on and so forth. Brain of infants have the ability to encode the language in a way that brain of an adult cannot. Infants begin life with brain systems that allow them to acquire any and all languages to which they are exposed. And as you, as you may notice, all of these points are really tied together, they are connected. And now let us move on uh, to the more thoughtful analyzing. A child is a very special creature that can decipher, or I would even say crack, each of the languages code in the natural way. Human languages are vastly complex code. Language is almost as complex as the brain itself. Language is comprised of tiny units that we call phonemes. They are separate sounds, and each language has a fixed amount of these sounds, no more and no less. They are the building block, blocks of the diverse system that is language. A small child possesses a brain that enables him or her to master his complex, this complex system without any outside instruction. And by the way, brain of an adult cannot do the same. The brain simply work differently, and we will discuss it later. And in the slide, you may see the steps of language acquisition, of first language acquisition. It is a long and active process that starts right after the birth. Child's brain acquires language naturally as the child lives in this language. He or she starts with observing and listening at one month old and continue with making a mental lexicon in the brain at 30 or 80 months. And here I think it is vital to say what the mental lexicon is. The mental lexicon is defined as a mental dictionary that contains information regarding a voice meaning, pronunciation, syntactic characteristics, and so on. Moreover, it is always a connected mind maps or connected by meaning or associations, words that may be different at the place of birth is different. And it is very interesting how mental lexical of the American child, for example, would be different from the mental lexicon of the Russian one, of the Russian child. And I mean, this pair of connected words, the associations, but of course not the um, words and language itself. And on the slide, you can see a mental lexicon of the American children uh, aged uh, six or seven. Here is the association, associations on the word school. And here you can see a truly American association, school and yellow bus. And I have many doubts uh, that for Russian children, school will be associated with the same thing. And as the mental lexicon is rising, the neural connections are rising too. And it means exactly learning or mastering the language process. It is a very quick and active process. Look at the slide. When a child is 30 or 80 months old, his or her neural connections are nearly as complex as the connection of an adult. Isn't it amazing? Child's brain also has to learn to differentiate thousands of phonemes of his or her language, while the difference between them is minimal. Look at the first picture demonstrating the work of the Wernicke's area. If you look at the process, of the process happening in a newborn's brain while he or she is listening to speech, if you look at the process that occur, 
first in, in a newborn's brain, then in a six months old's brain, and in a 12 months old's brain, we will see very different pictures, as you can see in the slide. The newborn's brain provides a very interesting picture. Despite the child just having been born, his or her brain reacts to the baby's native language very distinctly and in the right areas. And you will be right to ask how the baby knows which language is native to him or her because the baby hasn't yet started learning it. And the answer is easy. When the baby is in the mother warm, the baby can hear other people's speech and of course the voice of his or her mother. Thus we can say that a child gets some preliminary adaptation or preliminary conditioning to his or her native language even before being born. And on the next picture you can see the activation uh, of the Broca's area that is responsible for producing the speech and it is a peak of brain's activity when uh, brain is still decoding the language and at the same time tries to use this code. At this moment, child is mastering his or her native language and trying to produce it by themselves. Uh, and now let us uh, move on to the analysis of the second language acquisition. As we learn, children's brain is possessed to learn any language of any kind and it will be done easily. Adults are unable to do that. And actually, scientists still don't know why. <laughs> to master a language, not the language, not the native language that you are already use, but any second language, you need titanic effort. Some turn to textbooks, found themselves um, various, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> to textbooks, various instructions or teachers. Some having found themselves in a foreign linguistic environment try to learn the new language in a way uh, that resembles a little child but they rarely succeed and even if they do it's only partial success in short these processes are dramatically different firstly dealing with two or more languages alter the anatomical structure not only the functional structure but even the anatomical structure of the brain Gray matter becomes uh, thicker and even the thickness of the cortex changes. There is a special part of the brain starts working, the part which is responsible for language switching. Second language proficiency is also recorded in the brain as well as the procedural memory. So learning the second language not only does improve the quality of your life, it also improves the quality of your brain. So. I think I can congratulate you. congratulate you. Secondly, the process of learning itself is completely different. Learning a second language is not a separate and new process as the learning the first one. Second language acquisition is the process based on the first language and its rules, and it calls contrastive analysis hypothesis. Grammatical constructions and phonemic rules of the mother tongue are so strongly set in the brain that their influence is cannot be avoided. But as the grammatical rules is in, in one language are uh, differ from grammatical rules of another language, um, these rules transferring may have some negative aspects, and actually it always does. It is the so-called uh, common mistakes of the learners. And these mistakes are always specific for every step of learning new language. On the first steps of learning new language, there is also a common phenomenon called creative construction idea. When learners are trying to uh, subconsciously create, um, yes, I can say create some rules that are actually not existing in reality. And this language, uh, that is consist of both uh, native language and second language um, is called interlanguage. And it is basically one of the steps of second language acquisition. And later steps consist of mastering the language and trying to get rid of the mistakes. And the last and the highest step 
is making mental lexicon that, that is as similar to the mental lexicon of native speakers as possible. And before the conclusion, I want to stress once again the main difference in first and second language acquisition. So first language acquisition is done naturally, while the second language acquisition is done with using special methods. And the first language acquisition is um, done rather easily, while the second is quite difficult, we said, titanic effort. And uh, the first language is built as a primary one, while the second is built on the basis of the first language. And of course, different parts of the brain are working while we are um, learning the first and the second language. And we have come to the conclusion. So, for the conc to conclude my speech, I want to say uh, what we have done during this presentation. First of all, we have briefly get acquainted with a very interesting science, neurolinguistics. Secondly, we analyze the processes in the brain arising while we are acquiring first and second language. And moreover, now you know the main parts of the brain that are responsible for language and speech. So here is the references and I want to say big thank you for your attention. And I will be waiting for your questions in the comments below or in the private message. You can find me in the list of the members of this group by my name and surname. So yeah, thank you once again.